There's a handful of you who know me and my work personality, and there's nobody here who knows me and my home personality. I'm an incredible introvert at home. I'm an incredible extrovert at work. So I have to have some people that keep me on, on track. So if I go zipping through the slides, don't worry about it. The handout has absolutely everything that's there. When I gave them the choice of two different presentations, they liked them both, so I tried to merge them together. So there's probably more information here than I will be able to go through. So don't worry if I, if I flip through real quick or don't hit what you can read on the slides anyway. Um, they're all there in, in your packet. So let's start <clears throat> with Jacksonville Animal Care and Control, and this is what it was called before I before I joined the organization. And they had uh, a 17% live release rate. Um, on the right, you can see they cleaned all their cages with the animals still in them. Um, they had six, seven dogs per run and mass housed the cats. And, and the, the thought was, the more animals we he have here, the more animals that will be able to be sent out alive but their statistics weren't showing that. And I'm going to tell you, after 12 years of doing this and putting in some business models, right sizing your population will increase your adoptions tremendously. You've got to have the amount that your shelter can take, give or take a small percentage. But when you warehouse like this, more animals die, more animals get sick. There, there's so many more problems that um, it, it's just kind of crazy. When I came to Jacksonville, it had the lowest reputation in the state for any major city. Um, all of my colleagues were saying, don't you dare go there. It's going to ruin your reputation. Um, we need you other places. Um, I've always been one to take on the challenge. So I thought, if it's the worst, there's nowhere else to go but up, right? That You can't get any worse than worse. Um, and there were close to 20,000 shelter deaths when I was taken over, and the public hated animal control, and to tell you the truth, when I did my interview there, I could tell you why. Um, and during my interview, I actually gave them some pointers, and, and the interim management actually made some changes before I got there that actually helped me. They depopulated the shelter before I got there. It was a tragic few weeks for that shelter, but it set us on the right track to achieving the numbers that we achieve now. Um, they always had negative news stories, so we weren't allowed to talk to the press without going through the PIO, and they pretty much nixed all the stories, which for me is a problem because I like to get out the positive message. And I was very lucky because one time that uh, my PIO was sick, we happened to have a um, bust of a cruelty case and somehow the media got a tip and met me at the, at the, at the site. And when we got the good PR, um, I, they said, you know what? Would you mind handling your own PR? And I said, that's what I've been trying to do for the last year. So it was a serendipitous thing. Employee morale was pretty much non-existent, but the employees that were there were really good employees. I thought I was going to have to get rid of the entire staff in order to move forward. I only had to get rid of five key people over the first year in order to get us. Almost everybody who's there has been there or they've moved on. We needed to rebrand. This is what they used to have. Their, their badges didn't even match each other. The logo patch, whatever you want to call it, was horrible. And... That was what everybody knew. That was animal care and control, and I knew we had to. They, we weren't going to be doing that anymore, so we had to rebrand. Um, so we rebranded to Animal Care and Protective Services. Um, we built a new shelter. It was actually under construction, as you'll see it. This is out on the outside of the building. Um, I designed a new patch, kind of showing a more modern look of animal control, still showing the enforcement, but also somewhat friendly and reflecting that we're a community organization. And I think all these little subtle things help your staff feel better about themselves as well. Um, one of the biggest problems you have is people that don't have a clear vision or a clear mission. And it's what I see constantly when I'm out talking to animal control facilities is they're just trying to trudge day to day, not thinking ahead. 
Um, and, and that's been indoctrinated into them over a long time. But if you don't know where you're going, you've got no way to lay out a path to get there. And if you're only trying to go day by day, you're never going to improve. Now, the one thing I'm going to say is I know a lot of people always say, geez, we'd love to have you in, in our community. It's not always quite that easy. I got run out of town in my first community while I was agency of the year. So it, it, it's, you got to find the right match. And, and sometimes the upper level people are not ready for change. Jacksonville's been very, very good to me. Um, like I said, the philosophy was more animals on hand, more will get adopted. Um, so we decided you needed to establish a daily maximum population. Like I said, they depopulated the shelter before I got there, and then we actively managed the population. At the time, we were only saving 17%, so we had to start looking at which ones are savable easily, which ones are going to take us more time and effort, which we don't have right away. So we want to get from 17% to 20% to 25%. So we start going for the low-hanging fruit. So we started fast-tracking the really aggressive animals to make room for new animals as, as they came in to start concentrating on what we do. Now, if you go to our shelter, you'll see some relatively aggressive animals that we're working with to get adopted because we're at that point. But we weren't at that point when I first got there. It is expensive to be state of the art. And the problem was they were spending a lot of money inefficiently. Well, not a lot of money. Let me put it that way. A lot more money than I'm spending now, they were spending efficiently, inefficiently by getting the, the most expensive drugs, the most expensive cleaning chemicals, and they had, were taking in 25, we were taking in 25,000 animals with a $5 million budget and 62 employees, um, and only saving 17% of the animals. Right now, I have a $3 million budget, 44 employees, and we're saving close to 90 on our, on our good months. It, it drops a little during kitten season, but, but we'll get there eventually. Um, so we have to go back to the basics when I came in. We went, we went science-based on the cleaning methods, and we actually found a Wissy Wash, which is a product that we use, and it cut our cleaning expenses by about $100,000 a year compared to using trifectant on everything. Um, we alternate products over time so that you don't get anything that's building up resistance. But we, we also needed to know that there was a proper contact time. You can't just spray the stuff on and rinse it off. It's got to have some time to actually do work. And then when we have a chance, we actually will deep clean a run. And you'll see the runs. You may even see them deep cleaning the run. When everything's vacant, we can power up a power washer. We can use some harsher chemicals. And we pick up the grates, we do everything, and we just blast that place down where you can't really do that when animals are in there. One, for the water. Two, you don't want the airborne um, stuff going on. So, um, and they didn't have any sick bays. They didn't have any place to, to separate aggressive animals. Even when they built the shelter, they didn't. So we had to sort of make use of the shelter because when they designed the shelter, they were thinking in the old school of thought, and we were moving to a new school of thought. So while you, while you will like the shelter, if I had been here to redesign it, it would have been a little bit, still a little bit better than it is. Um, one of the biggest problems is the employees didn't know what they were supposed to be doing. They didn't know what the role of an animal control officer was. They didn't know what the role of a kennel person was or a vet tech. And because they didn't know what they were supposed to be doing, the job descriptions reflected that as well, because when HR came, and, and I'm a former HR professional, they interview the employees, the employees tell them what they do, and then they go write job descriptions. Well, if the employees don't know what they're doing, they write really crappy job descriptions, and it, it perpetuates, because now this is what is expected of the people. So first thing I did is I came in and said, I know what they're supposed to be doing, so let's rewrite all the job descriptions. And HR said, well, you can't do that because what happens if the people in those positions don't qualify? And I said, well, then we'll have to find them a new spot because I'm not going to let that hold us back. And realistically, everybody qualified. We had a couple 
we have to maybe enhance their skills um, for HR, but being an HR professional, I knew exactly what to tell them. So, but now everybody is, and then they've got a much clearer understanding. The other problem was they didn't have all the people in the right spots. They had a fantastic kennel manager, and guess where she was working? She was a supervisor of animal control. Didn't do a very good job at that. Didn't want to do that job. Um, when I told her that she was moving to the kennel, she didn't want to do that job either. But I convinced her that her skill set was right for that, and just to trust me. And the, you know, the only other alternative was she'd have to be looking for another job. You know, that's the advantage of being the guy in charge. You can kind of tell them what you want them to do, and they don't always have a lot of choice. Um, and we are civil service, so it's, it, they do have some job protections, but that doesn't mean I can't move them around to do whatever, whatever I want. Um, so that's where I think a lot of the organization did, it, it lacked uh, guidance. So we matched the people up with their skills. We had to go through a lot of new training, and we wrote new job descriptions. Here's the biggest thing, and, and I think you, you heard it from Dr. Farrell, and uh, that's the first time I saw Dr. Farrell's presentation. I really, really like it because it's, it's a business model, and it's the same thing that I'm telling you you need to do in animal control and you need to do in your animal welfare. You have to have a business model. Business models don't mean you don't care for the animals. In fact, I will tell you our business model means more animals leave alive. But in order to tell what you're doing, in order to tell what you're not doing, you've got to establish measures. You've got to establish processes and track them. My employees, if you talk to them on the tour, will tell you he asks us to track everything. Yes, we don't even know what he's doing. And sometimes they'll ask, they'll say, what am I, why do you want that information? And sometimes I have to say, I don't know. I don't need it right now, but if I need it down the road, I want to have a historic pattern that I can go look at. And if you don't save it now, then I have to only go forward and guess at what I'm doing rather than going backward. And, and that's just, again, expectations, telling them it's going to make their job better, you know, motivating the employees. Um, types of metrics we use now, we monitor the average length of stay, daily inventory and population, officer productivity and customer contacts, the live release rate, um, adoptions, transfers, and fosters, the three main ways animals are going out besides feral freedom. Um, adoptions, which are made what day, what hour of the day, to determine you know, what hours, what days we should be open. Um, euthanasia reasons, and as our number of euthanasias have gone down, our explanations have gotten more and more detailed, where when I first came, we might have had 10 different descriptions, behavior, medical, very, very broad. As we're getting down, now medical probably has 15 or 16 subcategories because I need to know is the skin condition demodex or is the skin condition sarcoptic mange or is the skin condition an unknown skin condition? Is upper respiratory, is, is it uh, what type of worms? I need to know exactly what is out there. Same thing with behavior. We no longer have behavior as an option. The only thing behavior related is we do safer testing, and if they don't meet our standards and safer, we will actually use that as, as our reason for euthanasia. Failed, safer, or not, I think it's not for adoption, safer, something like that. But then that also shows me where, if that becomes a big population, I know where I need to work. Our biggest population of euthanasia in the last few years has been kittens neonatals, and the, the young ones that are too young for sterilization. So once we measured that and we knew that, we didn't know it was just kittens, but it's actually a, a subgroup, our community got together because we work in a great coalition, and we opened a nursery. And we have a nursery that, that helps bridge that to get them up to what, about 1,000 animals a year go through that, through that nursery. It's run by the Humane Society and it's been a huge godsend for us. And we've learned, you know, we tried to handle too many neonatals the first year. The mortality rate was high, and, we, and then yet animal services was putting down an animal that might only be a pound away from, 
surgery. So we started shifting that around, and uh, Denise will be here on Saturday from JHS, and, and I would encourage you to, to talk to her about that. It's a, it's a really neat program. Um, we also at Animal Services now have started a big foster program, in, including people who have no intention of fostering when they bring their animal in, but I, I have a I've always had the um, good or bad, it's just me. I'm, I'm very straightforward. I'm very in your face. People, some people like it. Some people don't. So I was of the, pro the problem I had with us taking in animals was us telling people, oh, yes, we're going to do the best we can to place the animal. When they brought in an animal that just bit their kid and, you know, has a history of biting four or five animals. Now, you know, what I told my staff is, when you find that out, you tell them, really? It bit your kid. You've been irresponsible. You really think we're going to find that animal a new home? We're going to euthanize it if you leave it here. So you have the choice of trying to take it back home and, and getting its behavior or finding someone who can deal with this dog, but it will not be placed. So don't come here thinking this is the nice way for you to get out of your responsibility. A lot of people cry in intake. A lot of people have issues, but some of those people will take the dogs back. Some of those dog people will leave the dogs, but some of those people who leave the dogs, I suspect, won't own a dog again, which is actually the better thing for the community. You know, if, if I made that point and they're unwilling to put that kind of care in, they don't need another dog. So that's a, a future savings for us. Um, one of the things that, that kind of has irritated me from the beginning coming from a, from a management perspective. My MBA is actually in organizational management, so redoing organizations is sort of an important part, and, and along with that went HR. Um, we had these arbitrary holding periods. You know, we were holding cats for five days for owners to reclaim, but statistically owners were reclaiming them within 48 hours and they won't, weren't being reclaimed, and that went for dogs as well. I had to kind of compromise when I first came here because, of course, the public thinks the reason we have holding periods is to stop animal control from euthanizing animals. And I had to try to tell them, you know, a little different. So we negotiated, and we got to where since the reclaim rate for cats was less than 1%, we only had a one-day holding period. And I actually got this idea from Dr. Pisano, who now works um, for TZI, is that she would put the animals right in adoptions right away because you want them moving through quickly. You don't want them getting sick. The cats don't come in sick, but they get sick before they go out. So you've got to move them through faster. So we went to a quote-unquote one-day holding day, and that's actually the day they come in because they got to go to surgery the next day. So it, it's really an arbitrary one-day holding period. But our cat adoptions have gone up more than 400% since I made that change. We rarely have um, upper respiratory. Now, that doesn't mean that some of these cats don't go home and break with upper respiratory because they're getting home faster than the upper respiratory catches up with them. But what we find is twofold. One, sometimes the people think maybe they got it at their house and they don't even tell us about it. The other side is that all they need to, you know, we can, we can talk them through that. And they're attached to the animals. They won't bring the animals back. Um, and we've not had any, any problems with that at all. So one of the ways we've been kind of working things through is if, let's say we have that aggressive dog, and we know there's nothing you can do about it. Let's say, and we've had two of these, unfortunately, in the past couple of years, it, it, it was involved in a fatality. Why do I want to hold that dog for extended periods of time. So we've sort of narrowed it down. We still hold animals a long time. You'll see animals in, well, not anymore because we have our adoption event. But prior to our adoption event, you would have seen animals that were 30, 45 days in adoption. That's not uncommon. We give them as much chance as we can in order to move them through. But the ones that aren't going to be moved through, they have a relatively short holding period so that we can move on and use that cage for some other animal. That's one of the problems with mismanagement. You, your cage is a value to you. And if you don't move your animals through those cages, that's all kinds of more animals you're not being able to save. So my goal has always been the quicker we get them out, the better. 
when I first took over in Jacksonville, it was um, a case where the, they had like a 60 or $80 adoption fee and rescues paid half of that to take animals out. And I said, well, why are we charging rescues money to take animals out? Because for every day they sit in the kennel, it costs me $18 to care for them. So if we're charging them $40, it doesn't take very many days of them sitting in the kennel, and I'm losing money at $40. So I convinced the city, who's much more business-minded than, than I would have expected, that the thing to do is to move them through. We waive the fees. They go out totally vetted and everything. Um, we do ask them to license the pet, but that license can be then transferred to the next owner just because we know sometimes those owners won't come come back. And, and they've been real good about it because that's a lot cheaper than paying the $40. But, but as you'll see, hopefully we'll get to that slide. and It's in your packet anyway. We went from 300 animals a year being rescued to over 6,400 animals. And that's how you have to move animals through a public shelter. You don't have the time, you don't have the money to have them sit there for long periods of time because you got to quote unquote make money. For every animal that's adopted at $80, you've already sunk 40, you know, 40 times that amount, four, at least $400 into them, plus their holding period, plus the feed, plus if they get sick. So the faster they get through, what I like to, what I like to say is what you do in animal control, what you do in government sheltering is you try to stop the bleeding. Realistically, this is also the case for some of your rescues. Um, I recently have been doing some work with TZI and to go down and to see, oh, what, we get $300 an animal and, and we're making all this money. And I say, well, you know, how long are the animals in, in the cages? Well, you know, some of them might be here six months. And how much does it cost you per day to keep that animal? Well, $10. Okay, figure it out. You're losing money. And so reduce that, move them through faster, and you've got to think of the, the bigger picture. And for every day that that stays in that cage, that's another animal you can't rescue from somewhere else. I think we pretty much went through that stuff. So when I first got there, we had si what I like to call silos. Every section operated independently, and they sometimes worked against each other, uh, which was a real problem for me because I think out of anything, I've done probably... 10 or 15 different careers in my life. This is the longest career I've had at 12 years um, because I get bored and I move on when I get bored. And, and that's why animal welfare sort of, animal control sort of kept me because it's never boring. <laughs> that's the one thing I could say about it. So animal control to me or animal shelter and animal welfare is probably the most integrated job that I've ever worked in. Even though I can tell you there are other places that will tell you they're integrated. There's nothing that goes on from your field operations to your kennels to your veterinary service to intake that doesn't affect each and every other one of those functions. There's not, you can't pick something out in that group that doesn't affect another, another function. So we had to sort of mandate cross-training, um, especially for the animal control officers, because they're not in the shelter very long, you know, their, their office is their vehicle, they have a computer in it, and they move on. So when I hire a new animal control officer, they'll spend a couple months in the kennel and a few weeks in the veterinary area and probably a month in intake. So it's probably six months before they ever see the road, but that investment up front pays huge dividends down the road. Well, you know, oh, the kennel, all they do is pick up poop. Wait till you find out what the kennel really does. It's a whole lot more complicated than that. They're our first line of defense for disease. They're our first triage for the animals. There's all kinds of things. So um, we do that. And, and on occasion, you know, it, God forbid anybody should mention that in earshot of me, that they have forgotten that they don't just pick up poop because they will be back getting a refresher course in working in the kennels. Um, and, and they usually leave that very humble, and the, the kennel staff usually loves them because they've made up for all the bad things they've said to them that I didn't hear 
Um, and they know that I respect the kennel work enough to do that. Um, no business plan or model is, is how you're going to fail. Um, so you've got to do something. The, one of the things that also irritates me, and, and this is my, one of my greatest pet peeves currently, and, and I know some of you are going to be totally on the opposite side of this, um, the adoption process is designed to protect the animals. We've got to scrutinize the adopters. We've got to make sure that these are going to the best possible home. Problem with that is there really aren't that many bad homes or people coming to you that, that are the bad people. That's probably 5% at the outmost, and you're changing your policy for 95% of the population in order to concentrate on that 5%. You know what? It, you want to know what our adoption process is at animal care? We pull up and see if they have any complaints against them in our system. We take their driver's license, scan it into our system. We talk to them about their new dog, take their money, and let the dog go. That's all we do. We, we don't, you know, contracts, who's going to enforce a contract? All it does is create paperwork, and it's, it's an illusion, and it's just a waste of time. Um, Questionnaires, how are you going to keep this dog? That can be accomplished while you're taking their money, while you're doing that. That can all be verbal, and if a flag goes up, then, then we discuss that. But in most cases, if there's a problem person, and animal control is going to see them probably more than rescues are, we will eventually catch up with that person. And it's a very rare case that that happens, but maybe since I've been here, we've probably placed close to 80 or 90,000 animals, and we've probably had three that have come back as cruelty cases. Um, two of those were gotten at such a point that they were able to be saved, and one wasn't. So really, in the grand scheme of things, if I had a tight, tighter adoption process, more animals would have died because I refused to give them to good owners, questioning if they were good owners. Um, I also don't believe that rescues necessarily have to be a 501c3. Someone who wants to help one animal, that's good enough for me. Um, you know, we waive the, the $40 fee. Um, in fact, my, my biggest push in, in the coming year is going to be uh, adoption ambassadors, and I don't know whose term that is, but I know I borrowed it from somebody, where we're basically going to foster these animals out to individuals and allow them to place the animal allow them to do whatever they want, keep whatever revenue they decide they want to try to make from it, and just, you know, move on with not having our staff have to do that. Um, a lot of those we know, since we've already piloted this, end up in those homes as their pets. But a lot of them also get adopted, and, and a lot of these people have become volunteers at our big events because they like to see the people matched up with the dogs. One of the biggest issues that all of you will face, because I, I know we still face it, is over the years, the government, animal control, whoever did it, made surrender of animals easier than the adoption process. And the whole theory was, well, we're getting them to a better place. Send your animals to us when, when you don't want them anymore. And we helped feed irresponsibility by doing that. So now you've got to start taking the track going the other way, and you've got to start re-educating people. Um, we've instituted a, an intake fee to help offset some of the cost of taking people's animals. Um, I have asked my city council to tremendously increase that, and, and I'm really challenging them to think outside the box. We currently charge $25. It costs us $185, roughly, to move an animal from intake to adoption. So I'm asking city council to change that to $185. Um, so they pay the full cost. And what it's done, even the $25 has done, it encourages people to go ask their friends and their neighbors rather than coming to us immediately. Um, we still get a lot of animals in. Our, our, our surrender rate is still fairly high. But we know we've encouraged some of these people to find new homes. We've, we've sometimes got these people to keep their dogs especially when they know they're going to be euthanized, and they say, well, you know, I'm having such problems. Well, what problems are you having? Is it resources? Do you need to, to talk to a behavior person? Is, are you, did you just lose your job and you need food? We can get you food. 
Are you having medical veterinary issues? Well, I can always talk Rick into giving you some inexpensive <laughs> medical care. Um, you know, we, we all work together, and there, there are two food banks in the city, one at the Humane Society and one at Rick's group, and we do Meals on Wheels for pets. We call pet Meals on Wheels so that people that are in, um, housebound don't have to feed the other meals that they get to their animals. The animals actually get proper food. Again, we're only asking for identification. In Florida, it may be different than other places, but sure, you don't own your driver's license. In Florida, on the back of your license, it says it's the property of the state of Florida. As a government agency, we're arm of the state of Florida, so I can demand your driver's license at any time because it's not your property. We get in a lot of arguments with people because they don't believe that, but we scan them, and I actually now have their picture, their address, and whatever. So now, if they just surrendered the neighbor's dog that's been barking all night, when the neighbor comes in, we also have very broad public records requests. I can give them a picture of the person <laughs> who, who brought in the dog along with where they live, and they can take it up with that person. And we've not had too many problems with that. Uh, I won't say we haven't had any, but we haven't had too many. We are moving into to variable pricing and, and other incentives to try to get the dogs that are difficult to move, give them incentives to, for people to take them out, and maybe to collect maybe a little higher revenue for the ones that are in such high demand to kind of offset some of our, our costs. I'd like to get to a point where we're bringing in enough money with the highly adoptable animals that I can actually start paying rescues a stipend to take an animal because I know it's going to take them a while to get that adopted. So that's my, my future plan. Um, like I say, re for us, rescues aren't just groups, they're individuals. Um, we welcome everybody who comes into our shelter as if they're responsible until they prove otherwise. And the rescues have no fee for a fully vetted, except for the, the license fee, which is transferable. Um, we now do pet retention, whoops, pet retention counseling. Um, thanks to Rick, he's got a person that, that is sort of piloting that program for me to show the city or the county that it's working. Uh, he did it before with another employee, then I end up hiring him after. You know, it's sort of a trial basis, and it's hard sometimes to get governments to think about that, but when I can show uh, what I just reported to my council, the person I have from Rick who's doing um, pet retention, and what the impact of those animals would have been through the shelter. She's been there less than six months. She's already saved the city $86,700 in expenses that were avoided by those animals not coming through. It's going to be real easy for me to argue, give me you know, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 for that person when they're saving two or $300,000 a year. Um, we have limited intake hours, and we base them on our staffing. Why should I base my intake hours on how easy it is for you to come in and surrender your animal? I need to match it to my staffing, so we're open 8 to noon, Tuesday through Friday. Believe it or not, almost as many people surrender from 8 to noon as they did when we were open all day, because if, they, if that's the only thing they're going to do, they're going to make the change to get there. Um, they're going to grumble a little bit about it, but the, those, some of those other people will find other ways to get the animals. And, and why are we making it so easy? We aren't the best place. More animals die coming through our door than not coming through our door. We're a little different now, but I'm just going to talk in general. Um, but I also tend to be sort of in your face, and you'll see it in, in intake, and I'm going to warn you, there are graphic pictures in our intake. freaks people out, but I try to show the people what really is going on. You want to see what's going on in your community? You, know, you can watch Animal Planet and say, oh, look how bad it is there. Guess what? That's worse than that in your backyard. Um, so you'll see some graphic pictures. We have a sign up that tells what the euthanasia risk. Um, this is when we were over capacity, I believe. Um, so we had our euthanasia listed as very high. I think you'll probably see it now as sort of moderate because we just came from an adoption event, so we have some space. But we try to, try to be real up front. Um, this makes a lot of people cry. This, uh, I've had some people who've complained to staff who come back to me because they didn't, the, the people didn't want to complain to me, but they wanted to voice their opposition to this. And uh, again, I believe 
all the information. Don't ask a question you don't want the answer for because I'm going to tell you the answer whether you like the answer or not. Uh, city Council has learned that very well in my city too because um, sometimes they've asked questions that they, they don't. I'm going to flip through some of these just to get to this one. When I, the year before I started, roughly 24,000 animals were coming through the shelter. Five million dollar budget, 62 employees, and actually it bumped up to 64 shortly after I started. Their average daily population was 633, even though our old shelter and our new shelter have exactly the same capacity. Um, euthanasia was close to 20,000 animals. Animals that were simply dying in kennels was over 500. Um, owner surrenders were close to 6,000. Our live release across the board was 4,300, and our adoptions were 2,600, and our pet placement partners is what we call our rescues and, and individuals was only 379. Take a look at this year, we've, got, we've cut the intake down quite a bit, but we've also lost a lot of budget and a lot of staffing. We keep an average population that's very close to our capacity. Um, our euthanasia at our shelter alone was only 2150 this year. Um, we had 189 animals die in the shelter, and those were primarily animals that we Normally would have euthanized for humane reasons, but we tried something to save them and it didn't work. Or those are neonatals that we've tried to hang on to long enough to get a foster home. So really, the, there aren't animals dying in the shelter in the kennels. They're dying because we're trying to, to save animals that we wouldn't have tried to save before. Our owner surrenders are down. A couple of years ago, though, our owner surrenders were still close to 5,000, even though we had the hours change. I believe this is mostly due to our, our counseling and, and retention programs. Our live release rate is 82.2%. Uh, our adoptions only went up slightly, but that's one of the things you're going to have to realize. Every location is going to have its maximum amount of animals that can be placed from that location, whether it's a rescue. If you don't get out and do things like these events and get out to different venues or to have rescues, you're never, I'm never going to adopt 10,000 animals from our shelter. One, its location is not ideal, although it's not a bad location. And two, you just physically aren't going to move that many animals through quick enough. So our pet placement partners take on almost 6,000 more animals than they did when I first started. And to show you, it doesn't mean that we're not doing enforcement, because that's one of the things people say, well, you know, you can't have, those two are contradictory. You can't have high release rate and have no enforcement. In fact, we're the opposite. You can see our enforcement, um, the number of calls completed by officer has gone up substantially. The reason it dropped, tailed off at the end there is because we lost a few and had to move a few in to uh, work intake in the last budget. We lost 18 people. Um, so we, we had to make some adjustments, so that drop was there. But you also see our concentration on, and, and I'll tell you that the dip that is in the middle there in 2010, that's two years after I started, that's when I weeded out the people who would not fit in the organization. So you saw kind of a drop in population, and it's gone back up. But you can see we're doing a really good job enforcement. That's why we're the Enforcement Agency of the Year for the last three years. Um, and here, we'll just kind of show, this is where I'll end. There's more, a lot more slides for you, including some slides that, that sort of show you how you can take this into your community and do it. Um, but you can look at, at the intake kind of come down, the live release going up, and the shelter deaths going down substantially. You're starting to see the live release go down only because you're seeing the intake go down. It, it's not... You know, like the slide that uh, Rick had where you've got intake and live release approaching each other, although live release is going down and intake is going down. When those two match, that means zero animals are dying. So you've got to kind of watch that in, in, in that way. So I am going to wrap up. Um, you've got a lot more slides. Take a look at them. We do have a question and answer at the end if there's anything in those slides that you'd want me to talk to you about, feel free to approach me during this or at the end during question and answer, and I will be here all weekend as well with, with the conference. So I uh, appreciate your time.